you glad that he hears you when you call to him in prayer. Amen. Good to be in the house of the Lord this morning, isn't it? Amen. Amen. Won't you just turn and greet your neighbor, welcome each and every one of them here. Amen. Here I am to worship. Here I am to worship. Amen. Let's just worship him this morning. Oh, light of the world, you stepped down into darkness. Oh, Eyes, let me see. Oh, beauty that made oh, this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you, and here I am to worship. Oh, here I am. Oh, here I am to worship, 
seems to make a way when our backs are against the wall he comes in for us and you made a way for me when our back was against the wall and it looked as if it was over and you standing here only because you made oh and you you made a way for me when our back was against the wall and it looked as if it was over you made standing only because you made and you move mountains oh and you cause walls to fall oh with your power oh you perform miracles and there is nothing impossible and we're standing here only because you made and you move mountains oh and you cause walls to fall oh with your power oh who you perform There is nothing, oh, that's impossible, oh, and we're standing only because you made, oh, and you, you made a way for me, oh, when our back against the wall and it looked as if it was over you you made a way for me and we're standing here only because you made and you moved mountains you cause walls to fall oh with your power oh will you perform miracles and there is nothing oh well, that's impossible and we're standing only because you made and you move mountains oh and you cause walls to fall oh with your power oh you perform miracles there is nothing that's impossible 
seemeth no way possible, he comes in every time. Amen. At this time, I'd like to go to the prayer request this morning. I want to continue to lift up our brother Donnie Nicholson, that God would just continue to touch him and strengthen him in body. Amen. I want to continue to pray for Sister Roxy. She sees uh, the surgeon on Tuesday. Uh, it may take another four weeks until her two-foot incision May finally heal, and it has been about six weeks, and uh, for much wanted uh, surgery there. So we want to continue to remember Sister Roxy in our prayer. Also want to remember, please pray for my nephew Mark. He is having heart surgery, and uh, please continue to pray for Tyler for complete healing. Amen. So we want to remember them. Also want to continue to remember. Sister uh, Linda Cress in our prayers that God would just continue to touch her body and strengthen her as well. Dear church, please pray for Haven as she's not been feeling well. Thank you, Brother Nate Hill. We want to continue to remember them in our prayers. Amen. I want to remember Sister Erica Parker that God would just touch her body and strengthen her. Also, want to remember our pastor this morning as he brings the word of life to us. And then our sister Betty Morris, dealing with that kidney disease. And then continue to remember sister Sue Lambert as she's dealing with that hip and uh, foot there. That God would just continue to heal her. Also our brother Philip Rollincolly from brother Tim Pruitts had heart surgery this past week. So just can play for complete healing for him. And we would have an unspoken request you'd like to lift up to the Lord this morning. I'm going to ask brother Gabriel Spencer if he would just come. Lead us to the throne of grace this morning. It's good to be here this morning, isn't it? I was able to talk to Brother Philip this morning, and uh, they're actually planning on discharging him. He's discharged now or here in a couple hours. And, um, you know, what he had was a, what they would call the widow's maker. And God gave him purpose to live even, even longer. And, I just happen to believe for him that God's going to allow him to see his son come back. If you know anything about his story, and it may be bold of me to say that, but I can say that because a couple years ago I, I had prayed that I would see my brother and his wife come back. And I didn't know this until I just was walking in. And in that testimony, when I said that, I said, y'all will be able to believe what Brother Ron came and told me when he stepped out right where you were sitting at. And I was sitting there, and he told me that Michael and Alexa are coming. Well, they're here today, so that can just be a confirmation. Maybe there's a lost loved one that you have. I believe we're in for a special service this morning. Let's just take these needs to the Lord. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, you, you know how to just orchestrate things so perfectly and be able to bring things together just so perfectly. And... Lord Jesus, there's many needs in this building today, Lord, that many sick amongst us. And Lord, I just think that the, the physical needs that we have in our body, you allow us to go through those things because if we, if we were not sick, if we wouldn't have conditions as our pastor has in cancer, we wouldn't be able to see you as a healer. Lord Jesus, we wouldn't be able to see you as a savior if we weren't born in sin. And Lord Jesus, I think about all the prodigals that you're bringing back home and all the conditions that all the conditions that are going on in this world that can drag us so far out that we, there's no, it looks impossible for us to come back. It looks impossible for, for anything to happen. There's not one thing that we as men could say to our brother, or our sister, or son, or daughter. But all we do is we just put our loved ones into the hands of you because it's in your time that these things will happen. And they're, they will turn around and they may not even understand how or understand why they're coming back to church. But Lord Jesus, it's because you're wrapping it all up. Your seeds are coming back into one, Lord. And I just ask that you would just sweep across this building this morning, that this could just be a this could just be an everlasting, everlasting service that we will be able to look back unto in eternity and be able to say, look at look at the loved ones that we've had that, that we wrote down today that will be coming home. 
And it's in our, it's in, we have the power in our tongue to be able to claim and be speaking those things. And Lord Jesus, you've given us the authority to speak, speak love. You've given us the authority to speak, speak healing over top of every situation. And Lord Jesus, I just ask that you would just come down in a mighty powerful way this morning. You would be able to come down and you would allow us to draw closer. We know that there's things in our own life that you're continuously working on. We're not perfect, but you make us perfect because we are in you, Lord. I just ask that you would just come down in a mighty way and refill us with the Holy Ghost like never before. And as each and every one of us are in this building this morning, I ask that you will just be able to give us a special touch, a confirmation to know that you are with us and you will draw us into eternity. All the problems that we face, we don't need to worry about those. They will be taken care of in due time. We go through seasons just so you can mold us and make us into the, into the people you need us to be. And that's, that's only because one of these days you'll have to use us to help someone else. Lord Jesus, I just ask that you would just come and you would be with our pastor this morning. Anoint his lips, anoint the service that you could just come and use him as a vessel. Use him as a mouthpiece to proclaim your glory this morning. And we just thank you for all that you are doing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. This time we'll receive this morning's offering. You give as God's blessing. After you've given, you can be seated. We have Sister Heather, Sister Tracy come sing for us this morning if they would. Then we have Sister Melissa Hill come sing for us if she would. God bless you.
Spend my time running to all the wrong places. I thought that I would be the last one that you'd ever want to see. I was so far gone, the kind they give up on. But you. Your kindness led 
isn't our Lord wonderful? He's the God that changes our life. Amen. Would you stand for us this morning? That's the God that I know. The God that rescues us. Lord is my shepherd And he goes before me Defender behind me I won't fear I'm filled with anointing I'm filled with anointing My cup's overflowing No weapon can harm me I won't fear Well, hallelujah I guides me and he always guides me oh, through mountains and valleys his joy is refreshing restores my Say mercy and goodness. Oh, mercy and goodness. They give me assurance that I'll see his glory. Oh, face to face. Say hallelujah. Close, hallelujah. 
without music. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. I am not alone. He's my comfort. He's my comfort. He always holds me close. Oh, hallelujah. Why don't you give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One more time as Brother Ron comes this morning. Oh, hallelujah. I am not alone. Oh, he's my.
What a great night last night. I know you enjoyed that so much, and we, we were touched by Brother Danny's coming and how he, how he just spoke to our hearts in so many ways. And Every one of us has been in cycles. Every one of us has been in cycles, many of them wrong. And so I so enjoyed that last night, so appreciated Brother Mike for bringing him and and I know the I know the long flight and everything that took place and but God orchestrates everything so well and so amen. I want to say hello to a few people here today. First of all, I want to say happy birthday to Brother Meadows. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's see. Happy birthday to Brother Gabriel. Amen. And to a special little buddy, Layton is here with us today on his birthday. Amen. God bless you, Layton. Amen. Special presence to have Brother Michael and Sister Alexis with us today. And so we are so honored to have you guys here. Amen. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, we love you with all of our hearts. And thankful for what God's done for you. Amen. amen. Both of you. And amen. We, we, so, we so love you. Amen. And so we thank the Lord for that. We're so glad to have Brother Matt Dexter and his wife with us. And I'm sorry, it just slips my mind just now. But God knows your name anyway, so. Mary. Mary. Isn't that right, Mary? Yes. Well, I'm going to preach about Mary here in just a little bit, so you'll feel right at home. And so uh, they are, they're better known by their sons, Michael Dexter, uh, Brother Tim Pruitt's son-in-law, and then Brother David Dexter and his wife that was just here. And his wife is named Courtney, and uh, she sang for us while she was here. Uh, just something I'll just drop here. That I, I, th- I find cer- certain little things interesting. Most of you know that I, I'm an auction bug. And so we, we went to the, to the uh, Rockingham County Fair. And we were looking, we were looking at uh, the ducks. And so I just turned onto an auction. And there was some Hot Wheels for sale. And there was a collector selling his collection of Hot Wheels, and the Lord spoke to me and said, buy them because David Dexter's coming to the meeting. Hallelujah. No clue David Dexter was coming to the meeting. So if you saw me give Brother David Dexter a bag, it all came from God speaking to me two weeks before that he was going to be in this meeting. Amen. Isn't it good to us? Amen. We have some friends for, with us from overseas, so I, if you could stand and introduce yourself. Well, we're so honored to have you in the house of the Lord. God bless you. You win the award. <laughs> Yesterday, Brother Danny Del Mondo won the award, but today you win the award furthest away. And so, God bless you for being here with us in the house of the Lord. And so, we love you. And so, thank you for being here. Isn't he good to us? Good to have you too. Amen. God bless you. Amen. I'm missing somebody, and I'm looking, and I'm looking, and I'm going to get, I'm going to get to. Somebody, I'm going to get to them in just a second. Amen. Amen. Isn't it good? Isn't it good? Amen. Sister Abigail, glad to have your parents with us today. I've got a buddy here with me, Brother Nathan Ball. And uh, you know, you're too far from the pulpit, so I want you and your two sons. You may never do this again in your life, but you've got to do it for Brother Ron. 
I want you to come and sit with Andrew and the guys here this morning. Can you come? Amen. Give them a good hand for coming. While they're getting settled there, I got a special card this week, and I'd like to read it to you. I don't read all the cards that I, that I over a pulpit, but I, I got this one, and I thought it was so, in, so touching to me. Brother Ronald and Sister Connie, I want to personally thank, would like to thank you for the spectacular 50-year jubilee at Full Gospel Lighthouse Tabernacle in Elkton, Virginia. It is a dream come true. Homer Frazier would be so proud. I believe he would too. So proud of the celebration. My personal highlight of the whole weekend was when you said the the few original members of the church to stand and be recognized. It is truly worth all the years of attending church to finally be recognized for the faithful member. We, We are the few, the proud, the message believers and have been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks for all your love and support. Sister Pat. God bless you, Sister Pat. Amen. Amen. God bless each and every one of you. Sister Sue, God bless you. Thank you for being. You've been through a war. We have prayed for you every day. It's so good to see you last night here in the house of the Lord. And sometimes simple operations become very complex. And so... We just are thankful that you're here and a complete continued recovery. How's your nurse doing? Is he doing okay? He's doing wonderful. Amen. (laughs) Amen. Amen. You got a few moments. I want to share some things with you. Brother Nathan's been a buddy of mine since the 90s. And uh, we had weightlifting in common. We we enjoy we enjoyed weightlifting. I don't look like a weightlifter today. Time and cancer takes care of a lot of things, but there was a day that I benched almost 400 pounds and I squatted over 600 pounds. But there was nothing compared to this guy right here. In 2017, you got a microphone. I, I'm going to take you through an hour and a half testimony in five minutes if I can do that. In 2017, what did we, you were going through a prayer line. Can you share that with us? Well, uh, about a week before the, uh, Brother Ron came to our church, we go to Brother Joseph Hammond's church in uh, Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And uh, our pastor, Brother Joseph, had handed out checks. And Brother Ron said, you know, y'all did that here one time with, you know, Jesus Christ from the bank of heaven. And, you know, you fill out the check and, uh, my wife had filled out the check for the salvation of our children. <clears throat> and uh, the next week, Brother Ron came, and uh, we were standing in the prayer line. And, and I went and before my wife, and uh, Brother Ron, you know, prayed with me, which me and him have been buddies for a while, and we just was happy to see each other. And so my wife came uh, right after me, and she mentioned, she spoke to our pastor, Brother Joseph, and said that, uh, she said, you remember those checks you give us? You know, I wrote on that check for the salvation of my children. And, you know, they were lost in sin. And, you know, and uh, so she'd mentioned that to him. And then our pastor had leaned over and said something to Brother Ron. I don't know for sure what. But, and uh, Brother Ron, you know, uh, when he kept my wife come forward, he, uh, he said to my wife, he said, you know, didn't God bring your husband back? Because back in 2010, you know, God had brought me back. That's another long story, but, you know, I was deep in sin, and and, and she and I was about to get a divorce, and, you know, because I was just a, a monster, but, you know, God had a way of getting a hold of me, you know. It took a little time in prison and the federal marshals, but he got a hold of me, but uh, I, uh, but whenever uh, he, he said to my wife, he said, didn't God... You know, bring your husband back. Didn't he put you back together? You know, he said, there's, you know, nothing too hard for the Lord. And then he he stepped back and he looked at her and he said, uh, you know, 
I give you your children in the name of Jesus Christ. And then he shook his head, and he stepped back, and he said, I didn't say that. He did. And so my wife had held on to that since 2017. And she told everybody that. You know, anything, anytime somebody was mentioned about our kids, she said, well, they're coming. Brother Ron told me. Amen. Amen. And Well, a couple of weeks ago, my son here, Reed, the Lord got a hold of him at a Waffle House. <laughs> he's sitting, he's sitting Get a, Brother Reed to tell that story. I'm sorry, Reed. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Hallelujah. Why you got to do this to us? <laughs> Stupid yeah, yeah. devil. Man. I'm not good at this kind of stuff, but like he said, we, we like to weight lift. So uh, one Friday morning I got up and I just thought it was going to be a, another big day in the gym, you know. And uh, little did I know it was going to be something completely different. And uh, got out of the gym, still had a feeling that something was going to happen. And I called one of my buddies. He didn't answer. We usually go eat breakfast on Fridays, Saturdays. And uh, so... Normal breakfast, breakfast uh, spot I drove by, and it was, uh, it was really packed. So I said, I'm just going to go to Waffle House. And so I walked into Waffle House and uh, go and sit down at the bar because the place is full. And uh, there's an older gentleman walked in behind me, and there was two seats in between me. And he sits at one, on one of the empty seats on the other side. And behind him comes another, another couple. Like I said, the place was full. So he looks at me and says... Uh, would you scoot down so, so they could sit down? And um, I was like, man, this old man isn't going to tell me what to do. You know, I just came out of the gym. And uh, I look back because still, I still got a little nice bone in me. But I look back, asked them if they needed to sit down. And, and uh, they said, no, there's a booth about to come open. So I just went back to drinking my coffee and kind of gave this older man the cold shoulder. And... Uh, he still tries to talk to me. Like I said, I give him the cold shoulder. Then he starts talking about Fords, which we're Ford people over here. Yeah. But um, that's how you get to heaven. He said he drove us. <laughs> <laughs> he said he drove a seven three Ford. So I was like, man, I used to drive one of those. And you know, he just started talking about that. And then uh, another thing was he got his food before me. So I was like, oh man, come on. You know, I walk in before him, order, and he gets his food before me too. So, but uh, anyway, he he looks at me and he says. Uh, you know, it's not a coincidence that you're, you're, you're here today or I'm here. And uh, God knows it all, you know. He said, it's not a coincidence you're here today. And uh, he says, do you know where you're going to go today if you die? And I was like, oh, man, I hear, I've heard this so many times. And so I just kind of look away and start eating and say, uh, you know, that's kind of a complex question. Just continue to eat. And then just something comes over me and, I just start crying, and I say, you know, man, uh, it's not a complex question. I know where I'm going to go today, and it's not going to be a very good place if I died right now. And, uh, and he says, I continue eating, and he says, brother, you know that uh, you only get so many chances of God knocking on your door. And I've been in and out of church, and I'll be honest with you, that, that was the third time that uh, the good Lord has dealt with me. And uh, I'm pretty sure three is a good number, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. And uh, he says, uh, he says, you got, this is your chance today. He says, you're going to make one of the biggest and most important decisions of your life. And I don't say anything. You know, he gets up to walk out, and I asked him his name. Or no, he asked me my name, and I tell him, you know, Reed Ball. And, and then before he walks out, I say, uh, you know, sir, what's your name? And he looks at me and says, you'll remember me by Rich in Christ. Is what he said his name was, and he walks out the door, turns around, looks at me one more time, and says, I'll see you up there. Never seen him since. And after that, I just drive home just crying, you know, just asking the Lord, repenting, asking, you know, what, what, what must I do? And go home, and uh, I just I call up my pastor, Brother Donnie, because I live in Johnson City, and say I need to get baptized he says, when, son? And I say, right now, I, I don't know if I have an hour or, you know, a year or two left. I just, I just, I want to do it now. And he says, well, how long has the Lord been dealing with you? 
And I say, honestly, Brother Donnie, he never stopped. You know, he said, well, that sounds like our God. And I go, go to his house, and he has a pool there, and I get baptized. And uh, nothing crazy happens. You know, I don't feel no, no, no crazy inside of me. And, you know, but whenever I got out of the pool and I started walking up his big hill, I just realized that all my burdens and all the cares that I had before, the worries and everything, was just gone. And I want to praise God for that. And he's, he's seen me through. Elijah's 21. 22. 22. Sorry, it's a big deal. Big difference. <laughs> but God did a work for him in his life. And he was living in Johnson City with Reed. And God began to deal with him. And Brother Tim Pruitt, if I, I can share this with you, Brother Tim Pruitt, his first service back. And, and even Brother Nathan fought. You know, I don't want him home. He's messed up. I don't want him in my life. He's messed up. He's, you know, he's, he's doing a lot of bad things. And these boys never realized six weeks ago doing drugs, they'd be sitting on this pulpit today. <laughs> Isn't God good? And, and so anyway... His wife is, and he gets a text while the sermon's going forward. And Brother Joseph Hamid just begins to speak some things in prophecy. This boy comes home, and Brother Tim Pruitt preaches the next Sunday, and he hits repentance. Then the next Sunday, Brother Joseph Hamid is up during the night, all night, kind of like I was last night, all night. And he said, God's dealt with me to preach repentance again. And then at the end of the service, Brother Elijah walks to the, off, to the altar with his dad. And brother, and brother Joseph said, God showed me two boys that was coming to the Lord. And Brother Elijah gave his heart to the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Anything you want to add? Anything you want to say out there? Why did you do that, Brother Ron? Because let me just say this to you. This is our sign. There's our sign. Our prodigals are coming home. Hallelujah. Isn't he good to us? Hallelujah. Amen. Well, <clears throat> all these thoughts on my heart, I, a lot of other things. Last night I, I went to bed and somewhere around 4 o'clock. Sister Connie got up and went to the washroom and I said, good morning. She said, haven't you slept? And I said, I haven't slept a wink. And then I didn't sleep up until I think I went to sleep about five, and then we got up. We got up at our normal time a little bit later than that. But you're the reason. So we just thank God for what He's doing and want to be a part of it, don't you? So glad to be a part of it. Thank you, Brother Nathan. Thank you for coming. He told me, he said, I don't know why I came. I, I know why you came. And so, so I thank you guys. Amen. Brother Joseph is an incredible friend of ours. And, of course, Brother Donnie Reagan has been a bosom buddy since the very beginning. And so, amen. amen. He came to the message in 83. That's when I got married, got saved, got baptized, started preaching in 83. So, so we're celebrating our 40th year anniversary standing behind the pulpit. Amen. Amen. Isn't it good to us? Just praying we can celebrate the 41st one. That's what we're looking for. And so, God bless each and every one of you. I may have missed someone. Won't you just turn over to your neighbor and say, God bless you for being in the house of the Lord. And
God bless you. God bless you. I, I don't know your name in the back right there. God bless you. What's your name? Charlie. Charlie. I like Charlie. <laughs> Amen. My daddy was named Charlie. Amen. God bless you, Charlie. Amen. If I forget it next week, it'll be okay. God will never forget it. By the way, I'll be at Brother Kelly Hildebrandt's for his convention this week with Brother Tim and Brother Timothy. Pray for us this, this day that God would just be with us as we would fly there. And definitely pray for us as we fly that three flights don't become five flights. And so, and so we just pray that God would give us strength. I'm supposed to preach on Wednesday night after flying all day. So God, we're just asking God to give us strength there. Amen. Do you love him? Amen. Amen. I'd like to speak to you this morning on do you now believe? I want to emphasize on that now believe. If you'll turn with me in your scriptures this morning for our opening thoughts to John chapter 11 and verse 21. Isn't he good to us? Amen. Amen. Very familiar story, so don't get ahead of me if you don't mind. Then said Martha unto Jesus, and she approaches him in the right way, Lord, if thou would have been us here, my brother had not died. That's incredible faith. But I know that even now, what a statement. Even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. And Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall rise again. Verse 34. And said, Where have you laid him? And they said unto him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Beholding how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus, therefore groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. And Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he had been dead four days. And Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou had heardest me always, but because the people which stand by, I said it that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Brother Branham said, had he not called him by name, there would have been a general resurrection. And, And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. And Jesus said unto them, Loose him and let him go. What a powerful scripture. Let's talk to him. Lord Jesus, we love you today. We thank you to be in your house one more time. What an incredible opportunity that you give us to come and hear the words of the Lord come through the lips of man one more time. Now, Lord, it will go in many different places. It will go to many different hearts. Now, Lord, you know exactly, you know exactly how to deal with us today. Now, now, Father, 
I pray that you would send your word forth and may it live. Strengthen us today. You know my own physical being, the struggle that I'm in even in the last couple of days. We ask you that you would just come and give me strength. Anoint our lips and anoint our mind and anoint our vocal cords to speak the word. Now, Lord, I don't only ask for myself, but I ask you to anoint this congregation. May yesterday be over with, may tomorrow be somewhere in the future, but may we now catch this moment that we're in. And may you call us by name and speak to our hearts in a special way, we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen and amen. You can be seated. Brother Branham would tell the story. It's been told many times. There was a great circus that was taking place under a huge tent. There was a man that was, that was going to walk the high wire. And he walked it backwards and forwards. And as he did, everybody was applauding. And after a little while, he began to say, he pulled out a wheelbarrow. And he said, how many really believe that I can take this wheelbarrow across this high wire? And he began to work the audience a bit. Do you really believe Do you really believe? Do you really believe? And this one guy began to scream and he began to scream. I absolutely believe. And he said, well, if you really believe, get in the wheelbarrow. That's a catch-22 story. Do you really believe? Boy, you're quiet. Do you really? I'm not going to put you in a wheelbarrow. (laughs) But do you really believe? After everything that you have seen and everything that you have heard, many of you have been here for decades. You've heard some of the greatest sermons that's ever been preached. Some of the greatest men that's ever preached in shoe leather has came and preached to you. But just to sit and occupy time and to be entertained by it is not enough. But do you really believe? We're facing a challenge now more than facing cancer or facing job situations or facing your different difficulties of family life or economic situations. We're facing a a graveyard's. Where people have laid for maybe even a couple thousand years. Decomposed bodies are now into the gases. Do we really believe that the resurrection is right upon us? And they're standing just a half a step from us. Do we really believe that our gray hair and no longer need glasses and no longer need artificial limbs and all these different kind of things. Do we really believe that this message... Do we really believe that this message has the transforming power, not just to live an overcoming life, not just to help us to be good citizens of the kingdom of God, not just to be moms and dads and have good children and have a good community church, but do we really believe that in the moment of the twinkling of an eye, This message has produced the quality and the character to put us there. More than quotes, more than books, more than tapes, more than pictures. Come on, church. More than just having a a rah-rah, more than just emotions, more than all of that. But when it comes right down to it, do we believe? Sometimes impossibilities are more than our minds can comprehend. There's some boys sitting on this platform that a few weeks ago never thought in their wildest imagination, first of all, that they'd be in church. 
Second of all, they'd enjoy it. And then they would be here. And then they would testify to the world of what God has done for them. Sometimes things seem like it's a dream or an impossible situation. God takes impossibilities and makes realities out of it. Now, let me just drop back and give you a few quotes here. Brother Bam says, now, let there be. God spoke it, and it began to materialize. The very ground that you are set on here tonight is the Word of God materialized. Did you know that? Of course, we, we knew that. God just said it, let there be, and it was. He believed his own word. Then he's almighty God. And if he's almighty God, he can do all things. And if he cannot do all things, he is an almighty God. And if the scripture tells us that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He says now, in another place, he said, I'm so glad that Jesus left us a solid rock foundation of his resurrection. We don't have to wonder if it's the truth. The amazing thing is that so many people doesn't see it. He said, I've wondered it. Tonight, I'm going to try to approach it in the scriptures. Now, if you would notice that these ones that was at the tomb, I want you to catch these things. These ones that was at the tomb early in the morning, they met two men, which were angels, in in shining apparel, which said unto them that that he was, and he said, why seek ye the living? Why seek ye the living among the dead? And they had went to the tomb and found that he was not there. And they asked this notable question. Why are you seeking the living among the dead? And he said, these things he told you when he was in Galilee. Now watch what Brother Adam does with that. He said, maybe you might just have read that over the top. But let's just study that just for a moment. That angel. He said, he told you those things when he was in Galilee, and they didn't understand it, why they didn't get it. And here's another significance of it. These ones who told him thus, or told these disciples that was at the grave, that they must have been with him in Galilee, they knew what Jesus had told them before his crucifixion. Oh, what a blessing, you see. Those disciples didn't know that the angels were there. But they evidently was there. Because they said, did not he tell you these things while he was at Galilee? The angel was reminding them, while you sat in the meeting with him at Galilee, they didn't see the angels. They didn't see the angels. You don't have to see them, but they're here. And that fulfills the scriptures that the angels of God are encamped about those who fear him. And what a great thing that it is to know tonight that right in this building, there's angels of God standing in attention and they know every word that we say and everything that we do. And here's the scriptural proof of it. Did not... He tell you these things while he was at Galilee. Remember, he told you those things. Remember. Oh, what a marvelous word. He said, oh, I want to capture this. Oh, what a sad thing that's going to be for the lost. That after they have sealed their doom, after they've heard their last sermon, to be over in a devil's hell, lost, and no chance at all to repent. Now notice these words. 
to remember the opportunities that they've turned down. You say unto me, then preacher, it's their remembrance in hell. He said, Jesus said there was. He was a rich man that lifted up his eyes in hell and saw Abraham and Lazarus in his bosom. And he said, remember in your lifetime, there is a remembrance in hell. I want to just capture this before we go on. For the lost, how a horrible thing that it would be to know that the great meetings that they sat in and heard the mighty sermons of the anointed ministers of God. And not only that, but see the anointed signs and wonders and God performed among the people. And to remember all of these warnings and yet be lost. Why, it would haunt them forever. I'd like for that to stick with you if you can. So many times we have funerals. You go to funerals. And you know, a guy lives his life. He never did want to serve God. He never wanted to commit his life to God. He never wanted to do anything for God. But he dies. Because that's what we do. Without a rapture, that's what we do. That's a reality. But then a minister will stand in the, in the, at the podium. And he'll put that guy in heaven. Well, that man would be uncomfortable in heaven. He never wanted to go. I'm going to preach to you. He never wanted to go his whole life and maybe spend his life giving excuses. You got nobody to blame but yourself. Nobody to blame but yourself. God has had songs written to you. He's he's had preachers to preach to you. You made the choice. Don't blame me. Don't blame your wife. Don't blame your husband. Don't blame anybody. But Brother Ron, I had a bad life, but you had an opportunity. Don't bypass your opportunity. You may never get it again. You were going home to commit suicide, walking your way home. But God had different plans. And look at his family. Look at his family. What an opportunity. What an opportunity. I, I, you, you told me something last night about when you were in prison. Can I, can I relay that? He was in a heavy security Maximum security. God, you know, God's not really even interested in your situation. He's looking at your future. And he finds all of his kids in trouble. He's in prison, I think in Texas. He's in prison in Texas. He's in a behind a glass with other people, other other men. And and the guy asked him about serpent seed. What was the original sin in the garden? And he says, Well, it was sex. He said, Do you know a man named William Branham? Well, he grew up in that. But listen, he's a million miles from being converted. And now he's being reminded about what he grew up in. That man was in prison for something insignificant, basically. 
very rich man, had just forged something, shortened his name, wound up in his passport. Now he's in prison. He said, I won't be here but a few days, but I'm here for you. The man before him was a believer. That man gets dismissed. He takes his place. He's running from God. The first shipment that came from anywhere, not from his mom, not from his dad, not from anybody that's kin to him. Nobody even knew he was there. He gets a box of books. Serpent seed, church age book. Months later, he finds God. Let me just say this to you. God's determined to find his seed. Hallelujah. He's determined. Now, you remember that we sitting here today are the very projected thoughts of God. He just didn't think about the moon, the stars, and the earth. That was his first Bible. But he had you in his mind before the foundation of the world. Now, John 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But when the message came, our messenger took us back before there was a beginning. Because that mystery had to be hid till this end time under the seals to where God could reflect who was in his mind. And then he project his thoughts. And God's watched over you since before the foundation of the world. And even when Adam fell, God just didn't throw the book away. But then he watches over you through all of your genetics and through all your DNA. And I know you've heard this a thousand times. But never forget where God has brought you from. And you may say, well, Brother Ron, I've never seen a miracle. You are a miracle. To be sitting here, you are a miracle. Some of you are one in a family, and your family is dispersed in all kind of trouble, in all kind of situations, all kind of horrors that you went through. And, and you know, you could just write a book on the horrors that you saw, and yet God held you. Amen. He held you. And you go, well, I, I don't know what held me. I'll tell you what held you. God held you. A God that's rich in mercy. A God that watched over you. Put a protection around you. Put angels to watch over you. Just as much as God said let there be. Laying on the inside of you it lay dormant for a long time. But all of a sudden. A seed that God put there before the foundation of the world. God begins to brood over that seed. Now, no man can come to God unless the Spirit of God draws him. So God begins to brood over that seed. He begins to watch over that. Now, as our story begins to to share with us, that Brother Branham would tell us that, that Jesus and Lazarus were friends. Even before. And being friends, John was baptizing. And Lazarus took Jesus to be baptized. No doubt they'd had a lot of stories they shared together. They enjoyed one another's company. It was a place where Jesus could rest. (laughs) I personally would like to have a house to where that Jesus would enjoy coming to or Well, Brother Ron, that was 2,000 years. Well, let let me just bring it up a little bit. Maybe Brother Branham would enjoy coming and hanging out kind of like George and Hattie's house. And, you know, he could tell squirrel stories and he could talk about different things. Just be down to earth. Maybe Charlie's house. and You know, just be down to earth. Maybe sitting in, in northern Canada having a fire and with a young preacher named Eddie. And, you know, they're sitting there and one's taking a night watch and the other one's 
the other one sleeping. And, and he says, Eddie, go to sleep. And he said, I'll watch for a little while. And then when he, when he wakes him up, Brother Eddie said, I got up and I went over and sat where Brother Branham was sat. And he said, Brother Branham went down. He went to sleep. And he said, I just knew I had stepped into a presence Or the prophet was talking to God. And he'd been fellowshipping with that. He would later tell us about a car going down the road and an angel drops in the car. Right. How that, that presence pressed him against the window. He said, I hear people say, oh, I've had experiences like that. He said, I'll tell you, none of you have had an experience like that. Where that being is like that, sitting in that car. He said, I, when I finally looked at Brother Branham, he said he was ashen white and his beard was standing straight out. He said, after a bit we spoke and he said, every time he comes to me, something good always happens. And he said they were there to kill an animal. And he said, just down the road, there stood that animal. And Brother Branham just kept driving. He said, Brother Bram, it's close enough, it's close enough, it's close enough. He said, when I got out of the car to shoot him, he said, I literally had to look in the scope and try to find out where I was at on the animal. Amen. Listen, that's, that's almost impossible. It's almost impossible to be able to drive up on an animal. But because the presence in the car is greater than the creation. I'm dropping these things for you just for a moment. It's greater than your work life. It's greater than your situation. It's greater. It's greater. And he wants to experience how great he is. You say, well, Brother Ron, Waffle House? God's not ashamed of Waffle House. He'll find you in a bar joint. Worst fight I ever got in in my life. Worse. Was on a man called Brother Branham a false prophet. It was not a good night. What'd you do? Wasn't a good night for him. No doubt this home was a place where Jesus rested, enjoyed himself. But God knows all things. Now, he's on a, he's on a campaign. Lazarus becomes sick. Don't get ahead of me. Lazarus becomes sick. As he becomes sick, they send word to Jesus. No response. Even the disciples say, you know, should we go back maybe? He goes on. Amen. He even explains to him, to them, that he's only sleeping. Well, they don't understand. And he gets sicker, and he gets sicker. Now, you know, this is what the, the, the critics begin to get in. Now, you know, critics always come. Right. And so now he's, he's, he's getting sicker, and you know, he's, Jesus isn't coming. He isn't coming. You know, people get an attitude then, you know. He's not coming. He's right on time. And so, you know, he's going away and going the opposite direction, the way they think he should be going. And he dies. Now, you know, critic really turns up the the deal now. He's dead. He don't even show up for the funeral. Amen. <laughs> they wrap him. They take him to the grave. They place him in the grave. 
They sealed the grave with a rock. Then they hear that Jesus is coming. Well, sure, he's going to show up too late. He's going to, he's going to comfort the family. He's going to comfort them all right. You can hear the critic boom. Well, now he's showing up. Amen. <laughs> now he's showing up. Remember when Brother Branham was killing that 42-inch caribou and that silver-tipped grizzly bear? How many believe that was a vision? Amen. A vision become real. Right. You know, even, even when Brother Bud is walking down off of the hill after they've killed the 42-inch horns and measured it and it's absolutely perfect, they're walking down off of the hill and, and the brother goes, I don't see a bear for miles, and I can see for miles. He's a guide. And Brother Branham asked him, says, are you doubting the vision? I'm going somewhere with these things now. I'm kind of pulling different gears. And he's asking him, are you doubting the vision? No, I, I'm not doubting the vision, Brother Branham, because what happened with my brother with the seizures, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not doubting that vision. I'm not doubting, but I can't see it. It doesn't matter if you can't see it. He's still the same Jehovah Jireh. And Brother Branham kills this charging grizzly bear. You can watch that on YouTube. Get a good kick out of it. People standing in front of a charging grizzly bear. Where our prophet was standing in front of a charging grizzly bear. And he shoots it with too small a gun with one shot. But the vision said one shot. So Brother Branham was trusting the same vision that squirrels came, that a storm was out of existence. He was trusting that voice that he'd always trusted. Whether in the pulpit with people and critics and everywhere, never ashamed. If brother, he said if God spoke to him to go call George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, I'd call the whole world. But let me tell you, even greater than that, all of our loved ones are going to be called one of these mornings. They won't come out in an old body. They'll come out in a young a young body because that's what the word said they would do Lord if you would have been here my brother would not have died Brother Bram says, and when she got to him, she approached him the right way. She said, give him the right side title, Lord. She didn't upbraid him. Lord, if thou had been here, my brother wouldn't have not have died. Oh, my. I can see him pulling his little tired body together. And, and he said, she said, if thou would have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, but even now, whatever you ask God, God will give it to you. She knowed, notice these words, she knowed what the God of creation was. She knowed he was the anointed Messiah. She approached him in the right way upon her knees. Lord, if that would have been here. My brother would not have died. But even now, whatever you ask God, God will give it to you. Oh, if I could only think of, of that. Even now, Lord, whatever you ask God, God will give it to you. And he said, I am the resurrection and the life. No other man could ever say that. I am the resurrection and the life. Do we believe that? Do we really believe that? And he that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And he asked the question, believest thou 
this? And her response was, yea, Lord. I believe that, that you're the son of God that has come into the world. And he asked her a real important question. Where have you laid him? Some of us were laying in denominational tombs. Some of us were laying in some really bad sinful situations. We were wrapped up. Now, let's just, let's just think just for a minute. By the message of the hour, where was Lazarus at? He was in a place called, once he slipped from this realm of life, he slipped into a place called Abraham's bosom. And there was where the Old Testament saints were gathered, fellowshipping together, conversating together. Can you imagine many of them were looking at the prophecy that was to come? And looking at the prophecy to come maybe 800 years later, 1,000 years later, they died not being able to see that. But they held on to that prophecy, whether it's Isaiah or Jeremiah or Nehemiah or Nahum. They held on to the prophecy. They held on to the word, even though that their life expired and went into the dust of the earth. Even Job would ask the question, if a man die, will he live again? You know, we, we read in the scriptures about we read in the scriptures about resurrection of life and resurrection, the promise, and, and even, even Abraham would be dealt with, as we heard last night, Abraham being turned young again and, and Sarah be turned young again, even to the point to where a king would so want her as his wife. And I want to preach a sermon in a few weeks on the dilemma that God puts us in. And, and, and they are in this dilemma. There's a reason why they had to find themselves there because there's an end time bride that there's a message that's going to transform them to meet the challenge of the hour. You're not going to stay old. You're not going to stay bald-headed. You're not going to stay with cancer in your body. That's not what your projected future is. Brother Justin's an egg farmer, but that's just life. He owned the biggest egg farm in the whole state, in the whole United States of America. He owned it all, and he missed what God's doing here. All the outside world, the police world, all of that's important in this natural life. But it's not so important in that life. Amen. Brother Ron, hurry up. I got to go mow my grass. Really? It's too dry to mow your grass. Brother Ron, I, I got a pot roast. Well, I had one yesterday. It was really nice. had carrots, had mashed potatoes. They had gravy on top of it. It was really nice. Wish you'd have been there. Wouldn't have had enough for you all, but it was really nice. But Brother Ron, if you don't get done in 35 minutes, my pot roast is going to burn. You should have turned it on a lower setting. You learn a lot of things here. But Brother Ron, I got all of these things to do. We don't know what Lazarus did in his life. You know, there's not even a word that says what Lazarus did in his life, what his jobs were. But let me just say this, that wasn't important. He knew Jesus. Are you with me? There was incredible millionaires that were here when John Wesley was here. We don't know nothing about those millionaires and what they did, but we know where John Wesley's at. Let me just say, when this Laodicean age is over and we're in the rapture, what you're doing today in your work world won't matter too much. It's just stuff. It's just stuff. But even in the stuff, God can supply your need. 
Reed is a young Christian. Monday morning, he's watching last week's service. Well, as Brother Andrew and Brother William got blessed, well, I would say yes. But I want to tell you something else. He's sitting watching the service on Monday in his truck. It doesn't look like he's going to get any business today. But he accepted the blessing. He said, you pointed your finger at me. And before the day was over, his truck was full. We own the cat. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He's got the greatest economy that there is. You're God's children. You don't have to beg, borrow, and steal. You're his children. Do you now believe? Stop wringing your hands. Speak to your problem. Stop worrying. Speak to your situation. Lazarus, no doubt, was talking about, you guys talk, are talking about the prophecy. I've lived with him. He's here. He's on the earth. He stands maybe 5'9", probably doesn't weigh 150 pounds. He looks old for his age, kind of like Brother Ron. He looks old for his age. He might go on to tell a few things like his first miracle. There was a wedding took place. They run out of wine. You know, for, for the community, that was a big deal. They run out of wine. But I, I was there. And they brought it to him and asked him to bless it. And he blessed it. And when he blessed it, that water was the best wine. Because he's the God of creation. Quit looking at your impossibilities. And believe. You'll be well, Sue. You'll be well. This is just a trial. You'll be well. Your children are coming. Your children are coming. Do you believe? Amen. Do you believe? Amen. Do you believe? And he's talking to them about what he's done and what he's done and what he's done. <laughs> Forgive me, but let me just go on a sideline here. Elisha say, I, I think I've experienced something like that. You know, I asked Elijah for a double portion. And I knew that that wasn't Elijah that was producing that. That was God. And if I could get that God to live on the inside of me, I could not just have what Elijah had, but I could have a double portion of it. Not more, more, more powerful, but I could have twice as much. And I experienced it. And even when I was getting ready to die, laying on my, my deathbed, the one short of the miracle took place. But I died. And no doubt I had a lot of critics. God won't do what he said he'd do. God won't. Y'all been preaching rapture for 50 years. Y'all been preaching resurrection forever. Are you just building a church? No. God's building a bride. He's just got to wait till these guys come home. He'll not leave one. He'll not leave one. 
He's not interested in leaving one. Because when you realize that you're as eternal as God is eternal, he can never forget you. Hallelujah. It's not I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, I want it, I want it, I want it. Let me just say, God cannot forget his kids. been asked about the statement that I've made here and other places. Your church is not alive. Get up and move. I'm not just talking about dead churches or the message. I'm talking about denominational systems. Come out of her, my people. I got scripture for that. Come out of her, my people. Be not a potato. Don't waste your time. If I be guilty of that, I pray that every message church in the world gets filled with people full of the Holy Ghost. I'm tired of dead beats. I'm tired of people that are not committed. I want people that are on fire, full of passion, driven, driven, committed. Believe this message with all of their heart. That hurts people's feelings. Get over it. Start walking and praying for your empty pews and say, God, fill them with lively souls. I've been preaching life for 40 years. I'm not going to quit now. I'm not going to settle for some little denominational whimmy here. Brother Ron, we need to quieten things down. Talk to the angel that's doing the work. Don't blame me. Don't blame me. These people are only happy because of what they came out of and what they was. I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled. I once was a dope addict. I once was a harlotter. I once did a lot of things. But God rich in mercy. I never want to forget where God brought me from. Brother Ron, when we get on streets of gold, don't give me your excuses. Don't give me your excuses to wait. It's actually offensive. It's offensive to me. You're sitting here today and don't know God. Don't bypass your chance. Well, Brother Ron, I believe. Well, uh, let me just say drunkards believe. When I was doing dope, I believed. These boys believed. But when God comes and gets inside of you, and you may not feel any emotion, but you changed. But after that, you'll be refilled over and over and over again, and you'll become a drunkard. I promised myself I'd behave this morning. I'm having trouble. Where have you laid him? Because he knew what was getting ready to happen. He knew you were going to Waffle House before you chose it. So he decided to meet you there. He needed you, you to go home because he had two servants that's going to preach to you. One named Tim Pruitt, one named Joseph Hammond, and now Ron Spencer. And I'll be your buddy for however long he lets me be your buddy. When you, get, when you have problems, which you will, we're going to always be here. We're kind of like a compass. 
We're kind of like a North Star because Jesus is on the inside of us. And when you get in trouble, all you got to do is call, text, call, text. I answer better to text than I do calls. You know that, Matthew, and you're grinning ear to ear. And Jesus began to weep. And they said, well, he's weeping because he was his friend. They didn't know it. Brother Tim Pruitt preached in my mother's funeral. And because the director said, you've only got 45 minutes. And we had a few speakers. I told Brother Tim, I said, can you give us 10 minutes? I saw him set it on his, on his computer, 10 minutes. I watched it click down to 9.59. He closed his computer. It's done. It's, it can be done. I have a license. I'm the, he's, we're best friends. But in that 10 minutes, he said things that was so powerful, I will never forget. He said Jesus did not weep because they were friends. He said he wept because he had to call him from where he was at back into this world. And he would get sick again. And he would die again. And he would have trouble again. But he had to do it. God bless you, Brother Tim. He had to do it. To show people who he was. It won't be much longer. And Jesus said, roll away the stone. Now here comes the human element again. Lord, by now he stinketh. How many of you sit in a, in a pew where you're sitting? Maybe you've been moved around a little bit today. But where you're sitting, and you hear the voice of a minister and the devil whispers in your ear. How many of you? Amen. Okay, let's be honest now. I'll, I'll preach on liars if you guys. How many of you sit and listen to preachers and at the same time the enemy whispers in your ear? Amen. I, thought, I thought that would yeah. be a better rate. Because I didn't want to change the sermon. I'm getting too late. Come on. Do you mean to tell me, Brother Ron, I can be in the perfect will of God and the devil will steal? That's exactly right. But now he stinketh. And she was right. She was fundamentally right. But Jesus had a future. He had a future with Lazarus. We're going to eat together this evening. We're going to eat together this afternoon. He's going to be sitting at the table. And there's going to be people come to, 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 to kill him again. Stupid people say stupid things. And Jesus asked the girls, roll away the stone. Well, Brother Ron, we've heard that for, we've heard that for years, those women rolled the stone away. But have you looked at it in this context? There was critics. There was critics. But now, if they put their hands on that stone, they're committed. Once they put their hands on the stone, listen, Jesus, listen, the same God had opened up a Red Sea. The same God had taken Elisha and laid him in a tomb knowing he had one promise left. And they throwed a dead soldier in on top of it. And God raised that soldier back up. God will take care of his word. You, you don't have to fix it. You don't have to make it happen. 
Us preachers don't have to make the rapture happen. We don't have to make the resurrection. We just preach it. We just say these signs shall follow them that believe. And we'll lay hands on the sick and God does the work. We can't heal a soul. You're committed when you put your hands on the stone. Because he asked them, do you now believe? Now, once you now believe, now you're committed to it. It doesn't matter if every critic in your family is in your ear. You're convinced. Now, when you're convinced and it's sealed in your heart, Brother Stephen... Every devil in hell, every devil in hell can say everything that he wants to, but you and God have had a conversation. You and I had a conversation one time, and she wasn't a believer. But God showed me she would be a believer, and I told you something that looked like an impossibility. Everybody can say, well, she's a real believer. But you wasn't looking when we were looking. Oh, anybody can look backwards and say, well, God did that. and God. I'm talking about your future. Do you really believe that, that going from these seats to a rapture is just a moment away? shot I got a few more minutes to go here Jesus could have spoke their problem out of existence but they begin to push imagine what the critics now thought Jesus is letting those two women two women push that huge stone into place. He was doing it for a purpose. Jesus is letting his pride whip the devil in Laodicea. Who, brother, on you? In Russia, it was behind the Iron Curtain. In Russia, they were, this isn't for the faint of heart, but in Russia, they were, they were preparing a meeting. They were believers preparing a meeting in a, in a dark, dark, dark church. Soldiers come in with machine guns. He said, how many real believers do we have here in this building? And people scattered. They ran out the doors, jumped out every place that they could jump out. But about 15 stood there. He said, is that it? You ready to give your life? Yes. We'll give our life for this. Good. We're believers too. Kind of the same thing is happening here. Real believers are going to take a rapture. Make believers are going to give their life through the tribulation period. You know, sometimes we think, well, predestination is only for the bride. God knows where everybody's going. 
good, bad, and ugly. They roll the stone away. Now they're identified with what he said. Because they believe with all their heart. They're fully committed. They're fully committed. They believe the message is thus saith the Lord. And they're fully committed. That there was a voice behind the voice. Brother Ram was only standing near when God did those things. Now we're standing near when God does these, does these things. Do we really believe? And so we push the stone away. Now the God of two worlds begins to call Lazarus. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. And in that realm, Lazarus hears his voice. I've been thinking about this all night. There's never a voice like his voice. I heard it too. I heard it high on drugs one night. And the, the bed was spinning like this. And he spoke to me and said, Ron, where are you? I said, I'm a prodigal away from home. He said, come home. I stuffed all my clothes in a garbage bag. And home I came. I don't care where you are today in your life. I call to you. Come on. Brother Ron, I'm a mess. Brother Ron, I stink. Jesus is waiting outside your tomb. He's waiting outside of your tomb. My life's a mess. My life's a turmoil. What about Marcus? What about Marcus? He was spinning out of control for all of those years. And God saw the end result. What about your life? You never saw yourself sitting here. But God rich in mercy. Jason. You know, you know what Nathan's life was like. God's not going, well, I'm ashamed of him. I'm ashamed of him. He's looking at your future. He's looking at your future. He's, he's not, he's not. You know about God rich in mercy. He knows how to take the old deed and take all the liens against it. Don't beat yourself for everything that you've done, boys. That's done. It's over. It's past. That's dead. You buried him. You got baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Rise up and walk. Live. Breathe. Enjoy life. Send me an invitation to your wedding. Hallelujah. Oh, Brother Ron, I'm, we're not even interested. Oh, yeah. But he's changed your life. Hallelujah. You won't be going from house to house. Your house now, baby. <laughs> Connie says, oh, my God. <laughs> and I wasn't just playing right there. God has a future. God has a future. You'll tell that testimony the rest of your life, but there's a lot more that's going to go with it. There's a lot more that's went with it. There's a lot more that's went with your life. Your story only started there. It only started there. You know, maybe as as boys, you looked at the message as a law of do's and don'ts. You do this, you do this, you do this, you do this, you don't do this, you don't do this. Can you shake your head yes or no? You do this, you do this. And you thought, man, I'm in prison sitting here. I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like it. Not knowing what your future was. And once, once you get saved, 
You'll hear preachers say the same thing that they used to say, and now it's not you. You do the. You're going, amen, 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 amen. I don't know if you know what I just did. I actually just called you out of the grave. Instead of calling Lazarus, I called you by name. And you walked out of the grave. And Jesus told them, take the grave clothes off of Doug. I got some things I'm going to do with him. Take the grave clothes off of her. I got some things I'm going to do with her. Live. Live. I'm going to take the stink away. I'm going to wash you white as snow. Breathe, live. Do you now believe? You can stay standing. They said I would never walk again in 1994. Do you believe? They were going to harvest my organs in five hours because I was brain dead. Do you now believe? They say I'm a terminal patient. Just keep me comfortable for the rest of my days. But there will be a day that I stand here and say, ladies and gentlemen, I have something to tell the whole world. I'm cancer free. When I preach a sermon, I take it personal. I stood in my office, which these guys call a museum. I stood in my office this morning before daybreak. And I stood there and I said, God, you have met me here so many times I can't remember. But I want to tell you, I believe this message with all my heart. I'm fully committed. There's no going back. Now, greater than cancer, greater than your situation, but one morning between six and nine. More than a quote, more than a scripture, Belgium's a long way away in this realm, but it's a short way with God. A gathering takes place. A gathering takes place. And from another world, they've been waiting for this moment. You heard Brother Donnie say, Papa God stands up today. And today's the day. All of these years we've preached it, but today's the day. One of these services, it's going to be the day. It's going to be a Jericho march around here. We're full now, but we're going to fool it full then. Just start naming them because they're going to step here. Your mama's going to be here. Your daddy's going to be here. Your brother, your sister's going to be here. And the deal is, you're going to be young too. You're going to be young too. I want to ask you now, as I come to a close, do you believe? Do you believe? Do you believe? So now what do we do with what we've just heard? Tomorrow when you face your enemy, 
come back to this morning. And just tell him, why should I doubt? Why should I doubt? Why should I be in depression? Why should I struggle? Why should I fear? I'm preaching to you now. Tell your neighbor, why don't, why don't you, I want you to help me preach. Why should I doubt? Say it with an attitude. Why should I doubt? Now you're preaching Southern now. Why should I fear? Why should I struggle? Sister Janetta, come and claim it. Don't doubt it. Don't fear it. Do you now believe? Take it and believe it. Watch it come to pass. Hallelujah. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. Amen. I sing because I'm happy. Oh, I sing because that course together. been fighting depression and you say well my mama fought it my daddy fought it my I fought different habits I fought different situations I want to ask you do you believe you believe brother on do you mean I can I can just just let it go like that it's like a man a little boy holding a a bird in his hand He's nursed it and he's cared for it. But there comes a time. It, it comes a time, Gabrielle. You gotta toss it in the air. Because today you believe it can fly. Won't you just let depression go? Because a different one's in the room. You can feel him like a warm presence here. You can feel it like a wave as it comes through the audience. And it's your opportunity to say, I'm free. Why don't you where you're standing say, Brother Ron, I'm struggling with some things. Let it go today. Just let it go. Do you now believe? You believe. You struggle with insecurities and complexes. Let it go. Just let it go. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, 
We've heard our name called. Some sermons become more than a sermon, but they literally become a, a new walk. Lord, we don't have to fight depression. You're greater than depression. We don't have to fight and struggle with cancer. You're greater than cancer. Lord, even this morning, we commit our loved ones to you, Lord Jesus, and say, Holy Spirit, go get them. Whatever you got to do to get them home. You got to find them at a Waffle House. Bring them home. Oh, God, you came and got me in a whole lot of trouble, but you came and got me. And you was a father standing with your outstretched arms. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we raise our hands before you now and commit this service to you. Lord, we've heard your voice. Lord, let us take the grave clothes off of yesterday and come and sit at your table and enjoy. Lord, let us have liberty like never before, Father. Strengthen us, dear God. Where we're weak, make us strong. Where we're nervous, give us faith. Encourage us, Lord, in the battles of our life. Because I know you're watching over me. Thank you for that, Father. Let's just sing it together today and believe it with all of our hearts. Oh, I see because is I Your heart 
Hallelujah. 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 Oh, sickness leaves and bodies are restored when you feel the room. God, feel this room. Oh, every fear is destroyed when liberty fills this room. Say that together, he's in this room, he's in the room, he's in the room, he's in this room, he's in this room. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Lord, we love you. Lord, just like Lazarus. You called us out of a dead grave. When we were dead in our sins and trespasses of mistakes, Father, you came by our way with your spirit and quickened our hearts and made us alive in the promises of God. Lord, we are not ashamed to be alive in you. Lord, we're not afraid, Father, of this message. We're not ashamed of you bringing us to life. We're not ashamed to say that we're free from fear and free from doubt. We're not ashamed to say that we believed you in the tr midst of troubles, in the midst of crises, when it didn't look like things were happening. But six years later, you showed up. You showed up for Elijah. You showed up for Reed. Lord, your promises, Father, they don't have a time, a time stamp on them. Father, there's no expiration on your promises, Father. What's happening in this room this morning? Things that we prayed for, things that we've asked for, things that mothers and fathers ask for, things that daughters ask for. Lord, it's because you are in the room. It may look like you showed up late, but you were right on time. Lord, I, I, I want to echo, we believe you. Lord, we trust you. You're not going to leave us where you found us. Lord, you've come for us, Father. You made us new in your presence, oh God. And now we want to turn and give our thanks to you, Father. From a heart that has been restored. From a life that's been restored. From fear that's been robbed away from us. Stolen away from us. You've given us life abundantly. Lord, it's because of you, Father, we get in the wheelbarrow this morning. Because we know, God, that you've walked this way before. And Lord, we trust you enough to get in the wheelbarrow. Father, as we enter in, Lord, may you take us to higher heights and deeper depths, Lord, like never before. Lord, let us go into your promises like never before. In the name of Jesus Christ. Why don't you give God praise? Why don't you thank him from your lips? Why don't you say, God, you are mine? You're my rescue story. You're my everything. You're my all and you are my everything. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me see. Key of Jesus, cast it. Well, the weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. Oh. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve know only how to triumph. Oh, my God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. Oh, Well, I'm gonna see a victory. 
victory for the
Hallelujah. We've made our decision. Hallelujah. God bless you today. What a wonderful presence. What a wonderful sermon today. Hallelujah. If our, if our adult choir could stay after service just to run through a choir song today, we'd greatly appreciate that. I'm going to let you be dismissed today. Go remembering all of the needs and prayer requests this week. Remembering Brother Ron as he heads to Saskatchewan this coming week. That the Lord give him strength in the meetings there. That God would be a great success. God's gathering his children and we're going home. Amen. It won't be long, will it? God bless you. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord. The way going all the way. Oh.